Hello and welcome back to Pictorial on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose, and I'm someone who did not go to art school, but I love to continually learn about new art. And I'm Betty. I'm also someone who did not go to art school, but I have been working as a gallery guide at an art gallery for the past eight years, where I also get to learn a lot about new art, and I also do that outside the gallery, too. So today we are kicking off another very special two-part episode series, and this one is focused all about Indigenous art. And so this is broadly being divided into two episodes, one of which is going to be pretty depressing, and the other one is going to be not as depressing. So here's how this is going to (laughs) go. Basically, in this first episode, we really want to talk about the historical context of a lot of the Indigenous artists who are working today that we're going to be talking about in the next episode, as well as setting the stage and sort of how museums treat art and artifacts that were made by Indigenous people Um, focusing on the United States and Canada, which is where we are from. This is a bit like the episode we did a little while back about the British Museum and the looting of objects from various countries around the world um, through colonialism and how they are all now in the British Museum, among other places. But instead of sort of focusing in on specific objects in this episode, like we mostly did in that British Museum episode, we're going to be doing more of a general overview of what the actual history of this is and the major issues that have been around for centuries um, and still today in, I mean, obviously in just sort of general relationships and the way that different governments treat um, indigenous tribes, but also specifically in the art world and the way that art made by indigenous peoples is treated in mainstream museums. I personally, I work in a museum, as mentioned earlier, an art museum where there are displays of um, artists from all over the world, including Canada. We have a huge display of Canadian art and so including Indigenous Canadian art. And that has been changing over the years, of course, like a lot of ways we used to display we no longer do. And it's kind of going through a continual evolution. And yeah, so as Quinn mentioned, we're going to be talking about the context of these objects and kind of a general overview of indigenous history in North America, which obviously is impossible to cover in even a podcast. Um, But we'll be giving a general uh, brief overview. And specifically, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the history and Um, maybe even like political history uh, that's been going on in the last century or two. And you may hear like through some of our descriptions of, you know, these contexts, like we're not always talking about art and artworks. And that's because in order to understand where these artists are coming from and in order to understand the context, um, we can't just talk about art. We have to talk about the how these relationships and histories and people and the way they live and all these complex relationships ended up this way. That's kind of why you may not hear as much uh, in this episode about art itself or artists themselves and just more about general history. And obviously, we'll be glossing over a lot of information because, you know, we we don't have 10 years (laughs) of writing time. Yeah, we're pretty much going to be trying to gloss over um, decades and decades of history in this one episode. So this is obviously barely scratching the surface, and there will be more links in the description for further reading. If there is something that you would specifically like to learn more about that we mentioned today, those links will be available. Great. Yeah. So um, I kind of want to initially go over like a brief early history of indigenous people in North America and then get a little bit in depth of what's really been going on uh, in the last couple hundred years. And so a lot of my research is going to, a lot of my research and information is more focused on Canada because that's where uh, I happen to live. Uh, But a lot of this will pertain to the U.S. as well. And then obviously, you know, um, as we get closer to present day, we'll be talking about both countries. Um, but as many people may or may not know, uh, so North America has been inhabited for uh, over 10,000 years. Uh, it's believed that the first inhabitants arrived in Canada around 14,000 years ago, uh, and they most likely uh, entered through uh, what was at the time, a land bridge 
where the Bering Sea is. And so it's believed, or anthropologists believe that uh, people entered the Americas by pursuing mammals like the beaver, uh, like uh, musk ox, mastodons, woolly mammoths, and uh, early caribou. So, you know, they follow them into what's present day Canada and the US. And so obviously there were, uh, they spread out throughout um, all of the Americas, and eventually there were many different peoples and nations and civilizations all over the place. Um, but just as an, as an example, where I live, which is southern Ontario, um, the Wendat people uh, initially most likely came here here um, along the Aramosa River, I think that's what it's called, around 8,000 to 7,000 BCE. So that was about 10,000 years ago. So where I live has been inhabited for about 10,000 years. I should also mention here that I literally live in Chicago, which is actually uh, named as many, many things um, in North America are from an indigenous word. It's from a Miami, Illinois word. Uh, it's this <laughs> The initial word was a uh, Chicago, which means stinky onion. <laughs> that's <laughs> so that's literally awesome. what Chicago is. It's like a French, a Frenchized version of that word. Um, but because the, there's a garlic plant that grows along the river, and I guess that's officially why it's called. But also because this city is a stinky onion, I guess. And then where I grew up in down east Maine. I grew up really close to an actual Passamaquoddy reservation, and so the Passamaquoddy tribe is still very active in the area, although obviously not as much as it used to be before all their land was stolen, but there still is um, an active reservation where I grew up. And so I was lucky enough to have some connection to the indigenous people in the area where I was raised yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting to know. I didn't know that was what Chicago was called. So yeah. um, I didn't smell a lot of stinky onion when I visited, but I'll pay more attention next time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I think that the important thing that is, uh, or one of the important things to point out is that a lot of First Nations civilizations were uh, permanent urban settlements. So while a lot of uh, First Nations people are hunter-gatherers and nomadic. Uh, many of them did settle in permanent cities, agriculture, um, and they had like civic monuments and architecture and complex social hierarchies and governments and, you know, sort of all of the kinds of things that other people around the world would have. And so, because I think, uh, like one misconception I do hear about is people think like all First Nations people in Canada and the U.S. were uh, hunter-gatherers or nomadic, like completely and never settled into nation states and potentially this is like one of the arguments that people make on why European colonialism is somewhat justified because it you know gave these people governing structures and things like that but they already had it <laughs> so some of the things I want to talk about in terms of recent Canadian histories is a thing uh, called treaties so treaties are all over the world um, many different countries have treaties with each other like you know peace treaties um, there are agreements between different people and in Canada we have a lot of them uh, and a lot of them are between First Nations people and the official government so um, in fact most of the uh, there's a series of treaties uh, like official treaties that are agreed upon between First Nations in Canada and um, like the official Canadian government they actually mostly date from 1871 to 1921 so again these are recent they weren't signed like 400 years ago they were signed um, about 100 years ago from now. And so these policies are meant to ratify agreements, uh, again, between Canada and Aboriginal people. And there are things like, you know, land treaties, certain rights to hunting and fishing, um, certain just certain rights in general. And so the Supreme Court of Canada actually argue that treaties serve as to reconcile pre-existing Aboriginal sovereignty and assumed Crown sovereignty. And so they Essentially, First Nations people, they interpret the agreements um, to last, quote, as long as the sun shines, grass grows and river flows. So these treaties are not like they don't expire in 10, 20 years. They are forever. Just like peace treaties, peace treaties. If you signed a peace treaty with Japan, it's not like uh, we'll have peace for 50 years and we'll invade you again. It's no, we have peace forever until something else 
gets declared or signed. Um, and more specifically, like, for example, where I live here in Toronto, we're covered under uh, what's called Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So that's a treaty that was established uh, when Toronto, when its area uh, was like purchased by the Europeans, uh, settlers from various people who lived on this land at the time. Um, however, the problem with that treaty is there were a lot of disputes and disagreements that were never worked out. A lot of the people who supposedly had rights to the land didn't actually. So um, it, it's really a mess. Um, but uh, so what some people, I don't know if the U.S. does this, but in Canada, a lot of places now uh, read land acknowledgments. Uh, so they'll uh, it might be on their website, it might be on the wall of a building, it might be uh, somebody might say it when they're making like a official presentation. And um, some people think it like, oh, land acknowledgments, it's just like pandering to indigenous people. Maybe sometimes it is. But um, a lot of these land acknowledgments is to recognize these official legal treaties that were signed. So it, which uh, acknowledges, you know, what rights somebody has. So it's not like it's not just a ceremonial thing it's like a legally binding agreement uh, so that's what i think i want to uh, emphasize and then the other thing is so uh, an art related aspect of this is um, for example in the ago and maybe a lot of places in um, that have indigenous museums and quote unquote artifacts uh, will have these uh, belts they're called wampum belts they're these tubular or they're made of tubular beads that are made from shells or sometimes like other animal feathers and quills and they're primarily used by aboriginal aboriginal people um, of the eastern woodlands to make like ornamental or ceremonial uh, just like agreements and so a lot of these treaties are written on them um, so you'll see these treaties being displayed again there some of them are really beautiful but they're also historical they signify these like legal agreements between the Europeans and um, whoever was living on the land at the time and again they were signed like about a hundred years ago so um, for people to say like oh forget about it that was like hundreds of years ago it's like well uh, maybe then you don't own your house because like you're if you've lived in your house your your house for 50 years and somebody comes and says actually that was a long time ago i'm just going to take it would you be happy probably not <laughs> similar to canada the united states does have like over 500 treaties with various native american tribes um they are supposed to be like permanent agreements until some other like kind of treaty or something like that would replace them however the united states government has violated every single one like not not some not even most every single one has been violated by the united states government even though they have been violated they still are under legal effect um, and they still are you know supposed to be in effect today um, so a lot of Native Americans are still fighting to, like, get these treaty rights back in place or, like, to maintain them in various courts um, around the country. And so so in the ones that I have records of here, it's f over the course of about 100 years from the late 1700s to the late 1800s is when all of these were signed. Um, but they still all have active legal effect today. And many of them are, like, an active legal battle in courts right now. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. And Canada, the Canadian government is essentially the same, has the same record of violating uh, all of them, uh, surpri not surprisingly. <laughs> so, um, and, and I just realized, so um, I think like I've, like we've both kind of been, I've, I've at least been using like words like indigenous and native kind of interchangeably. And in Canada, there, in Canada, there actually are a few like legal definitions for these terms. Um, but uh, of course, like, you know, sometimes I'm using them interchangeably without uh, knowing it. Um, so generally, like when I when people use the word indigenous, um, like they mean people who are indigenous to a region, uh, who cannot trace their ancestry to another part of the world. One of the reasons can Canadian pe uh, people and Canadian natives don't always use the term native is because it could be confusing 
it's because uh, some people think native means I was born here. So if you were born in Canada or the U.S., some people think I'm native to this country, which I guess you could interpret it that way. But indigenous goes one step further and says, I'm not just I wasn't just born here. All of the ancestry I could ever trace was born here. And then in Canada, there's also a lot of other terms. I won't go through all of them. But um, the term First Nations is often used to encompass pretty much um, and anyone uh, who is um, an indigenous, indigenous person in Canada or North America or somebody who belonged either in a tribe or in actually a first, uh, an indigenous nation. Um, but I don't really know. I actually still don't know why. Maybe someone can explain to me. For some reason in Canada, this term is applied to everybody except Inuits. But so the other word I do want to bring up, uh, which is controversial, um, is that in Canada, in some cases, we still use the word Indian because of its legal representation. We had the introduction of the Indian Act in 1876, which uh, was an act that actually granted certain rights and promises to people who fall under this status as a status Indian. So um, often it's used in a lot of legal documents and a lot of people who are indigenous Canadian people will say I'm an Indian and either they say that by preference or they say that as a I'm an Indian, I'm entitled to this, 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 and this. But we have two different types of Indians. We have status Indian, which is uh, the government acknowledges this person's right to live either on the reserve and access to treaty rights and whatever they're entitled to. A non-status Indian is someone who is indigenous, uh, is, you know, a native or Inuit, um, but the government does not acknowledge that person as an Indian for a lot of different reasons. So, for example, uh, the Newfoundland up until recently actually didn't recognize the Mi'kmaq people, the first people that was encountered. Newfoundland was like, we don't have natives here. Oh, God. And then the natives, were, the Mi'kmaq people were like, uh, hi. So re- more recently, they were recognized. I think Indigenous has become much more popular, especially in sort of like youth circles and online circles, um, because it is an umbrella term where you can you're saying like Indigenous uh, um, Americans, Indigenous Canadians, Indigenous Australians is another huge um, group of concern. Yeah. And it also like doesn't have the same confusion that happens sometimes where like people who are not Indigenous co-opting lots of uh indigenous terms actually but as like the word native specifically in saying like oh i'm a native new yorker and it's like are you or did you just grow up in new york because like <laughs> i think those mean two different things um so it just it's both like broad in a way to be able to describe um lots of different people in lots of different areas in the world depending on what word you add after it um but also specific into what it actually means without sort of other definitions watering it down Exactly. So like it, it is it's quite um, in, in some cases, it can be quite complex. And in some cases that, yeah, there are um, overarching terms that can be more inclusive of everyone who is indigenous to um, a particular land. And so pre- the previously mentioned statuses, the Indian status. So a, a indigenous person could choose to, I guess, assimilate, like become non Native, So they can choose to um, absolve or they can choose to give up all of their legal rights and title as being an Indian and choose to just become like a subject of the queen or whatever Canadian. And but the problem is they a lot of them didn't integrate and a lot of them couldn't and then at the same time lost the rights of what they previously had. Um, So, you know, it's kind of like... basically losing on all fronts uh, in that case. Yeah, there were massive, horrific campaigns um, across the U.S. and I'm assuming in Canada as well to try to force Native people into, as you say, like assimilating into um, a different culture and and sort of these legal incentives and like making this an official legal process of like... (laughs) sign on the dotted line and give up your citizenship um (laughs) but also just uh re-education schools um and forcing uh 
forcing Native children to not speak their own languages and to not learn their own crafts and be connected with their own culture and heritage. That went on for so long and had an incredibly devastating effect into the history and the art and the language and culture and everything of Native American people in this attempt to basically eradicate their culture because I guess killing most of them wasn't enough. And so the governments were like, well, um, I... Well, we're still going to keep trying to murder them, but in the meantime, I guess we can also try to force them to become as close to white people as possible. And I mean, this is what we started with and what we're sort of getting to overall is we're getting closer and closer to actual art conversation. (laughs) But a huge problem around all of this is that in schools and in museums, Native American culture, the Native Canadian culture and First Nations is presented as something that is in the past and like closer to the natural world and sort of natural history than it is to uh, like art museums and like high culture and art when first of all that's complete BS and second of all is a living breathing culture in like many many different nations of peoples that are alive right now despite our government's best efforts over the centuries but most public education and most large art museums are actively working in this basically conspiracy campaign to make us think that indigenous peoples like don't really exist anymore just one last thing, as, as you mentioned earlier in schools, that the thing that I do, I think mo- many people internationally would have heard about Canada doing. Um, and again, this isn't specific to Canada, but we did do some of the most horrific things in this respect is um, our residential school system. Um, So again, similar to the scoop, there was an official policy and an official program by the Canadian government, uh, it's the Department of Indian Affairs, where they created a school system uh, with the purpose of removing Indigenous children from their homes uh, and as removing them from their own, cu- own culture and to assimilate into Canadian culture. They literally use the words to kill the Indian in the child, referring back to your murder um, comment earlier. They, they were like, yeah, we're not killing them literally. We're just killing the Indian in them. So over the course of the system, um, about I read uh, the lower estimates it is 150,000 uh, kids were placed in residential schools. And actually, and then the residential school related deaths is actually an unknown mystery. But um, there it's at, that's estimated between 3000 and 6000. So the program be- began in 1847 and ended, not kidding, in 1996. Yeah. The Canadian government, so they were, it was in partnership with uh, Christian churches, and they ran over 130 different boarding schools across Canada. Uh, so uh, the schools, like, you know, they're meant to be educational, but they were often plague-ridden, underfounded, or full of disease and abuse of all sorts. Um, a lot of the kids came out of these systems, again, th- with the intention that they would fit into mainstream Canadian culture, but they didn't. And they were subject still to racism. And um, they also couldn't fit back into their own communities because they no longer speak the language, have any idea about their culture. Um, and then they, yeah, that's one of the many reasons why they're uh, many Native Canadians today uh, suffer from post-traumatic stress, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide, and basically you name it. Um, it you know, it's it, a lot of, you know, like over, like it, it's believed that over like about one third of Indigenous children were taken to these residential schools. So as much as one third of all Indigenous Canadians today experience this type of abuse for their entire childhood. In June 2008, um, at the time, Prime Minister Stephen Harper actually offered a public apology on behalf of the government of Canada. um, And he also invoked uh, the the start of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which was established to uncover the truth about the schools. And I believe the publication of the uh, TRC report came out in 2015. A lot of people seem to think it was Trudeau because obviously it came out when Trudeau was um, prime minister. A lot of people think like Trudeau created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but it was actually our conservative prime minister, Stephen Harper, who did that. So 
So um, obviously, you know, like Trudeau and the our liberal government also also supported. Um, but it, this is a bipartisan support by uh, uh, like all Canadian governments recognizing this is horrific. Um, and in addition to that, um, because of what they did and um, how they forced Indigenous people to assimilate into like a Eurocentric society, and again, this whole like kill, literally killing um, the Indian in the person, Canada actually technically violated the United Nations Genocide Convention that Canada ourselves signed in 1949 and was passed through our parliament in 1952. So a lot of people actually think that Canada can be tried in the International Court for Genocide. So like, just so people understand the extent of how bad this was, like, it's unanimously agreed that it's horrific, not just by Canada, not just by Indigenous people, but by the entire world. Yeah, I do have to laugh a little bit. And it's like, the government... Our, our government agrees that it was horrific and it's like oh they said sorry and then they wrote a report about it <laughs> like what it but what did you do though like what did you actually do to help make up for it? <sighs> okay um but yeah and on the united nations things as well like um when i mentioned before that uh the united states has violated every treaty with native american tribes um and that those some of those treaties are being fought in court right now. Uh, those treaties are also being fought before the United Nations for very similar reasons um, of the United States government committing genocide against its indigenous peoples. Um, yeah, fun. Very, very cheerful topic we've done today. <laughs> but I mean, this is very serious, very current stuff going on. Definitely. And I, I, do, I do just want to say that, like, yeah, I we have a lot of Indigenous art um, in, in the um, gallery that I work in. And um, often when I have tours with, um, there are a lot of tourists do visit because we're one of the largest, you know, it's like a top uh, tourism spot when you come to Toronto. And so I get a lot of international visitors. And I do have to explain the background and uh, for some to understand some of the Indigenous art. And yeah, of course, like, usually I like I just see like shocked faces with jaws on the floor when I talk about some of this stuff and again like I love Canada I love my country like I I'm, I'm an immigrant myself um, I am not native to Canada <laughs> so um, I you know um, Canadians in general like 99.9 percent .9 have been the loveliest people um, and I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world and I think despite the many problems in our government um, it, it, they at least try sometimes um, so so like I do want to say like I, I love living in this country but um, it's very important to to recognize um, our, our history and um, like yeah obviously you know we have this report and the government said sorry and uh, but like it, it's which is not doing that much but it is at least you know, the first step in reconciliation is to recognize we did these things. And um, I, I do think like people I know in my life, if they listen to this podcast, will not be happy with me because a lot of people are still in denial about the actual history of Canada. And to these people, I just want to say, you can stop listening <laughs> if you're that angry. <laughs> so, no, listen to the next one, next podcast. It was going to be less depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and as we mentioned before, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today is going to be very directly relevant in to the artists that we are talking about in the next episode. But to touch on a few things in sort of contemporary museum culture um, of today, um, I've already ranted a bit about this. But um, besides the ma massive problems that like virtually like every museum that has indigenous art in it is stolen in some way or another um unless it's by a contemporary artist who did sell that piece to a collector or a museum like that's where it all came from because they were either directly stolen at the time or there was an agreement made that was later broken um etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah pretty much all of it um as well as this problem with framing that we've already talked about a bunch about how uh, museums treat indigenous cultures like they are things of the past instead of things of the present slash with a direct lineage to the present um and then another huge thing is that a lot of museums have items that are not just art pieces but are actually sacred um to different 
tribes. Uh, they are religious items or even actual human remains. And a very important piece of legislation related to this in the United States is called NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, so what that means is that basically, hey, if you are a museum that has any kind of federal funding, um, then you have to give it back. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is like a spe a specifically with um, human remains um, and related to burial and graves um they museums have to make their have to make every attempt to return them uh to the tribe in which they were stolen from um or to otherwise be in contract with representatives from whatever tribe that they came from in order to best preserve them and store them in safely and with respect so this has made a huge difference in getting what are actual human remains of actual human beings that were not being treated with respect um, to actually being returned, um, as well as other kind of sacred objects, funerary objects, um, other things that are very culturally important um, and should be and needed to be treated as sacred as any other religions, um, sacred objects. But unfortunately, repatriation is very slow. Sometimes there are difficulties identifying things. Sometimes they're very difficult to transport. Um, and a huge problem with this is that it doesn't apply to privately held collections. But also, private collectors can lend out to museums. And so sometimes there can be, like, public museum displays um, of objects that, like, by all ethical measure, should be repatriated back to the people that they came from. Um, and to just do a very specific example of that, in 2018, there was an exhibit called um, Art of Native America, which from the Charles and Valerie Diker collection, um, and this was at the Met, and they did this collection, and the Association on American Indian Affairs um, was like, uh, hey, these are a bunch of sacred objects and this is really bad and you shouldn't be doing this and even calling it art in the first place because that's an incorrect, uh, because that is not the most accurate term for what these a lot of these pieces are. And then it was like, we met with indigenous groups and then they did not provide any more specifics. Um, and oh my God. <laughs> so the the representatives who were lodging a complaint against this was like, that doesn't mean anything. What are you even talking about? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that is just... One very recent, very specific example of how just having NAGPRA established in 1990, like, did not fix everything. And there are still um, in museums and the art world in general, like, lots of ongoing problems about how objects are collected and displayed. Yeah, I definitely um, have heard of a few instances in, in Canada of, uh, well, so I've heard of a few instances, there are many instances of uh, indigenous art that were stolen and or just forcibly taken uh, or just found um, and that were put into museums uh, that still belong to or sh or technically belong to um, indigenous people. And so I tried, um, when you mentioned this topic, I tried to look for if we have, if Canada has a similar uh, legislation to NAGPRA, but my conclusion is that we don't like some museums have their own voluntary policies and some do try to repatriate. Um, I came across a few articles uh, actually earlier this year in March 2020. Uh, there was a local British Columbia artist who went to the Royal BC Museum in Victoria, BC and saw a blanket that um, their grandma made and was like, oh, my God, we've been looking for it for like at like decades and um we're like well that's cool that my grandma's pant blanket is at this museum but we would like it back um so i think the bc either did or is currently maybe trying to pass some sort of law to repatriate art repatriate art and some um museums like the royal bc museums are making a, an attempt at um uh, returning artworks but as you said it's complicated and in some cases it's don't want to um but i won't get into too much of that you can listen to our other episode about art looting uh in that regard um but yeah like i it doesn't seem like we have an official or legal policy in canada similar to that and we probably should um like the biggest things i could find is you know either people lobbying for that type of uh, act to come through or like you know 
uh, institutions themselves voluntarily doing it if they actually have a policy. And, but the other thing that some of the articles I read pointed out is that, you know, this person happened to have gone into a BC museum and saw their grandma's blanket. And that was like really lucky. Uh, but you know, how many more works are there where they don't see it? And in fact, a lot of museums, they don't display all of their collection, like the AGO only displays five to 10% of our permanent collection, maybe sometimes even less um, in public. And some works never see the light of day they're sitting in a storage box for like centuries so your family like uh, artwork or maybe cultural artifact or maybe human remains might be sitting in a basement of some art museum and you'll just never know Um, and no attempts have been made to find out like who owned this or return it which obviously is very difficult to do Um, but yeah this is continuously going to be a problem in museums for probably forever. (laughs) Uh... Yeah, and then going back to what you said earlier about uh, artists or uh, sort of Native Canadian American art being treated as um, these like natural history objects. Um, A specific example is for decades, the Canadian artist Daphne Ojig, she Uh, She was kind of treated as like, um, I think as she describes, like a relic of a past culture that no longer exists. Like works that she does were put as like, you know, like a museum piece to represent all these like, it's almost like you're like, oh, look at these people from like 20,000 years ago who lived on this land. And she's a contemporary artist. She only died in 2016. So, you know, being treated as somebody from like, a millennia ago is just weird actually um and so yeah a lot of uh, and a lot of other uh canadian uh indigenous artists and i'm sure in uh the us as well um you know have been actively trying to uh fight against this image and um some of them are successful some of them are not <laughs> On that topic as well, just a few notes having to do with uh, sort of the ongoing fight around (laughs) museums Um, today. A couple of very recent updates, um, one of which was in June, the American Museum of Natural History announced that they would be removing the Theodore Roosevelt statue at the front of the museum. Um, And I couldn't really remember this statue. And I was like, oh, just... I wonder why. Obviously, Theodore Roosevelt has a very poor history with indigenous peoples in the United States, like every president. But um, but I was like, oh, that seems like very specific. And then I looked up the statue. (laughs) It was a statue (laughs) of Theodore Roosevelt on a horse flanked on either side by a Native American man and a black man um, just kind of next to him. Uh, uh, walking on the ground on either side of his horse. It's a very confusing statue. I guess he's supposedly, like, leading them. I don't... I didn't bother to look up what the original purpose of the statue was because just looking at it, especially... Like, Theodore Roosevelt was no friend to Native Americans. I'm like, who made this? (laughs) Oh, okay. So they actually just very recently removed that. And then another really recent update is the Met, who had that problem in 2018, as I spoke about a few minutes ago, just in September of 2020, hired their very first Native American art curator. So they now have a specific curator whose name is Patricia Mara Quinn Norby um, to actually oversee the Native American art in the Met specifically, um, which it's wild that they've never had one before, mm-hmm. but that's good. I, you know, this is progress. So hopefully this is just one of many steps um, that are necessary to fully return the art um, and the artifacts of people's cultures and to just generally properly pay for art and to commission it from contemporary uh, Native American artists and all of those good things. So I will be watching with interest to see... um, what changes, if any, I'm having an associate curator of Native American art does for the Met. 
kind of my gist of everything I've spoke about today um, is like I do, um, I do, you know, want listeners to understand that this is a very complex history. Um, like it's not just, oh, you know, we took land and killed people that happened, but a, a lot more things happened. And um, it, the contemporary landscape of Indigenous peoples and as well as artists is, has a diversity of problems. But um but I think in understanding that, like, we can move forward, um, even though it's quite slow. On a more positive note, as we said in the very beginning of this episode, our next episode will be focused on some more contemporary Indigenous artists um, and the work that they've made and have displayed in various places and looking at how they have taken the incredible trauma um, that their nations have gone through um, and channeled that into some of their artwork and the way that they express their history through different ways. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening to this kind of unusual episode of Pictorial. You can find our show notes at relay.fm slash pictorial. And like I mentioned, there are a lot more in-depth sort of resources about Indigenous history um, in North America. Um that goes more in depth of some of the stuff that we talked about here today. You can also follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Pictorial Pod, or you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Aspiring Robot FM. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Articulations V, and I'm also on YouTube as Articulations. And speaking of YouTube, we also upload these episodes to YouTube, uh, where we usually will have pictures of what we speak about on the screen. We spoke a little bit less about our work itself, so this episode may not be too image heavy, but um, there will be some stuff you can look at. Thanks for listening, art enthusiasts.